how patients inappropriately end up in the emergency room or in the hospital. And he recognized that the majority of cost that we're wasting on our patients is not on biologic therapy, but it's on the inappropriate use of going to the emergency room and the hospital, and patients spending days there sometimes when they never needed to in the first place. So he's developed this program called Project Sonar, where he measures patients, he asks them to report their symptoms, and when a nurse who monitors how all the patients are doing electronically by using their smartphones or their tablets or computers notices that a patient's symptoms are getting worse, they have the patient come to the office before they get sick, sort of like treat to target. We're looking to see if those ulcers are big enough and make sure treatment changes happen, but we're not waiting for patients to come and tell us how sick they are or to end up in the hospital before we adapt their therapy. We're doing a preemptive strike before something happens, and that's the work that Larry's done, and in fact, showed that he's able to keep people out of the emergency department and out of the hospital. So from this work, we've worked very hard with the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation to try to take a step back and make sure that we're doing this correctly. And we have a great opportunity where we could start from the beginning and make sure that we even understand what good Sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. We've worked together with our partners at the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation to first identify what our mission is and what are we trying to do. The mission statement is we're trying to improve the quality of care delivered to patients with IBD. The term delivered is highlighted in bold for very important reasons. That doesn't mean we're trying to write about or talk about what good quality means, but let's make sure that our patients are getting what we're talking about and what we want them to get in the first place. To do that, we didn't want to just take guidelines that were out there. We really wanted to think carefully if we had the standards of care for IBD in place. So we wanted to make sure that we could define those standards, not just working uh, alone, but working with patients, working with nurses, with nurse practitioners and surgeons to understand what we mean by good quality of care. And then we wanted to develop an implementation program so that we can, in fact, measure ourselves and make sure that we're doing a good job. Part of what we talked about is similar to what Dr. Irving said. When you're continually monitoring yourself, you can't just make an adjustment in their care and assume that we've had a victory, but make small changes, measure again, see how you're doing, and continuously improve what we're doing because we know that we have a long way to go in helping our patients with inflammatory bowel disease. And then finally, and only finally, measure and improve the impact on patients on outcomes. But that takes some time. That's not something you can do a six or a 12-month period, but something that you're continually refining your program to look at those outcomes that we're trying to do. When you think about quality of care, there are different measures that you can create. There's something called process measures, and their outcome measures. I'll show you the outcome measures in a little bit, which are arguably more important, but process measures are much easy to measure and much easy for you to pay attention to. We talked about testing for tuberculosis before starting anti-TNF therapy, looking for C. difficile during flares, doing a sigmoidoscopy, taking biopsies for CMV when a patient has steroid refractory ulcerative colitis when they're in the hospital checking thiopurine levels, uh, I'm sorry, TPMT levels before starting thiopurines, and then making sure that we're actually recommending steroid sparing agents if somebody's been on steroids for more than four months. We talk about that all the time. We know it's important, but we don't measure that we actually do it. And that's where things fall down, because patients feel better, they don't come back, they call again six or 12 months later during a colonoscopy, and they get back on steroids because it's the easiest thing to do, cheaper and very quick, where we need to measure that we're moving on to these other things. Thinking about colectomy for low-grade or high-grade dysplasia, talking to our patients about smoking, and educating patients regarding vaccinations. These are all very important, but our, I would argue none of these alone are really going to improve the care of our patients or improve their quality of lives. But things that we can do to measure ourselves to make sure we're giving the very basic level of care that our patients deserve. The outcome measures are more important. And you can see by looking at these, especially the last few on the right side, is that patients were very much involved in this. Patients were in the room with us when we were discussing these outcome measures. And this is what we learned from our colleagues, from surgeons, from nurses and nurse practitioners, and again, primarily from patients, of what's important as far as the outcomes. How do we know that our patients are doing better in their lives? The obvious ones are there, steroid-free clinical remission. This is the main endpoint of all of our clinical trials, and I'm glad that we all agreed that this is one of the most important things we should be looking at. 
But look at these others, days lost from work or school. How much school are our patients missing? How often are they off from work? Days hospitalized, visits to the emergency department, malnutrition, something that we're very bad at. I'm not sure about here in Columbia or in other parts of the world. In the United States, gastroenterologists have almost zero training in diet and nutrition, and something that we're really bad at and, again, need improvement. Anemia. We all know how to check a hemoglobin and how to check iron levels, but who of us are really comfortable in how to appropriately replace iron and which method and form to use when our patients are anemic? Narcotic use, a very big problem. Incontinence for our patients, something that we don't talk about, never ever measured in clinical trials, but one of the most disturbing and problematic parts for our patients. And then, of course, normal health quality of life. And then again, from our patients, nighttime bowel movements and leakage. If they're up all night and having to change the sheets and can't get a good night's sleep, the rest of their lives are often miserable and something that we really need to focus on. So what we developed and what is IBD Chorus is what we call a learning health system meaning we're all learning together from patients, we're learning from each other, and then we're teaching the other groups and how to do this. The way we do this is something called a feed-forward design, meaning we're getting information from patients who feed it into the system, and then we have information from providers and from the medical record coming into the system. And then the centerpiece is the part that really makes this important. It's this idea of establishing a culture of a partnership for co-production of care. This is not something that we're telling patients, we're going to collect data and then we're going to make your lives better. This is asking patients to be partners in their care, to really understand what these outcome measures are, to push us and remind us that their lives aren't as good as they should be, and to really engage with us in the office visit and between office visits so it's not the patient simply walking into the office, we tell them they should change their medications, they go home and we hope that they do it, maybe they do it, maybe they don't do it, then they come back six months or one year later to see if they're making any progress. And those are the parts of this that we really need to make a difference, is helping our patients understand that they need to be part of this co-production of care. We've developed a shared data platform. I'll show you what that looks like. And then the most important part of how this works are the quality improvement methods that we use. We can't just sit there and hope that we do the right thing, but we really need to put some systematic methodology in place here. This isn't something that you need to be part of Improved Care Now or Sonar or Chorus to do. This is something you can do in your office with a piece of paper where you hand out and collect metrics from your patients and measure yourselves. You don't need a big, fancy, expensive database like we've created here. I would argue it's far too expensive than it ever should have been. However, we need to somehow collect information so we know how we're doing so that we can make a difference. Something called a Breakthrough Series Collaborative, I'll show you a little bit about in a minute. Our first focus was similar to Dr. Kaczynski's focus in the state of Illinois, which is preventing emergency room visits. We also recognized at the same time that this is a very big problem for our patients. For us, if our patients call and end up in the emergency room, almost 100% of the time they leave there with steroids, narcotics, and a CT scan three things that aren't good for them and three things that aren't going to improve their care and something we're really trying to prevent. We've also developed something called care pathways. As I mentioned, we think we're very bad at nutrition, so we develop care pathways around how we can identify patients at risk for malnutrition, treat them appropriately, and how to identify patients who are either anemic or iron deficient, who may have a poor quality of life from fatigue that we need to address and make them feel better before they get sick and before they get into trouble. And then by putting this all together, we try to learn from each other. We have a number of uh, sites across the country who are using these different methodologies, learn from their patients, and in turn, we teach each other, which is why we call it a learning health system, such that then what we learn, we can spread through the rest of the world and take some learnings for what we do in what we like to call our test kitchen of trying things, see if they work. If they don't work, we abandon them. If they do work, we spread them even further. Here's the group of IBD Chorus sites that we have currently. We're slowly growing. We started with five sites, we went to 10 sites, now we have 20 sites, and just today we actually are inviting our next 10 group of uh, sites. So we'll have 30 centers across the country. These centers are an interesting mix. 
of both large community practices who are busy with IBD, but also academic centers that are taking care of sometimes 10,000 patients with inflammatory bowel disease. So a great mix here. You can see on this list some of the world experts that you may recognize in IBD, but there's some other people who you don't know, and I would argue you probably should know because they're some of the best IBD clinicians in the country. And these are people in community practices who are very busy seeing patients every day and take care of so many IBD patients, and they have a lot to teach those who are in the academic hospitals. So it's a nice collaboration and learning from those who are really on the front lines, taking care of many, many patients, and also the academicians who are doing the research, doing the other work, that we could teach each other what we learn ultimately. These were the group of first 10 sites. You could see the next 10 sites that came on board. We had a Dr. Sanborn site in California. We had a Dr. Uh, Steve Hanauer site in Chicago, but we also added a number of, again, fantastic community-based practices that we can lear learn from and all share from each other. The term that we like is this idea of what's called a collaboratory. This is a made-up word, of course, of the word collaboration and laboratory. We're all working together to see what we can learn. Our 20 and now 30 GI practices follow about 50,000 patients. Imagine the power of how much we can learn together. Again, I told you the mix of community and large academic centers, and each practice has a quality improvement team who they've identified. They have a physician leader, they typically have a nurse, and then a coordinator. In some cases, that coordinator is a card-carrying research coordinator. In others, it's an administrator or a medical student or somebody who just wants to help and really be part of this, who's helping register patients and collect our data so that we can understand this. Each practice also has been asked to identify patient leads. Who in your practice do you think can really help guide you in how you do things at an individual practice to make it better? This isn't a clinical trial. We haven't prescribed for people of what to do every day in their practice. We simply give them the tools and teach them about quality improvement so they can see what works best in their practice. What works best in the practice in Omaha, Nebraska is going to be very different than works in the practice in Los Angeles, California. And again, we have this real-world laboratory where we can test, we can implement, and we can spread ideas that work. We use something called the model for improvement. If you've ever done any quality work or read about quality improvement, this is the key about how you do quality improvement. It's not take an idea and spread it to your entire practice of thousands of patients or an entire country of providers. You start very small. You start with one patient. You start with 10 patients and then maybe one day in your clinic and see if it works. See if trying to give out, as we did, an urgent care hotline card so that patients can call us when they feel that they want to go to the emergency room instead of going to the emergency room works. Try it out in a few patients first and make sure that somebody actually answers the phone or that the answering machine works, that you can get back to your patients in a timely fashion. And once things work in that plan and then do cycle, so you've thought of an idea, you've tried it out, then you study it. You study it in 10 patients and see if it works. And if it didn't, see what you can change so that you can act on that change and then go around and around on that cycle again, much as the treat-to-target approach that Dr. Irving told us about. Test something out, move on. If it doesn't work, try something else and keep trying it. This Breakthrough Series Collaborative is a syst systematic methodology that was developed by a group called the Institute for Healthcare Improvement and tells us how to go through the processes of these plan, do, study, act cycles until you make a difference. It allows this continuous evaluation and improvement. It leads to the, the development of best practices. And as part of this, all of our sites had calls once a month. All groups of, at the time, 20 sites were on the phone sharing best practices, sharing ideas. We would share data transparently. Uh, practices would allow us to show how they're doing so that we can learn from their mistakes or learn from great successes, and then we hear from those who are making good progress so we can all spread that. We also have in-person learning sessions twice a year. We all get together. It's a group about this size now, and we all get together and share what we've learned and share what we can do. In working on emergency room prevention, which I told you was our first goal of how can we keep people out of the emergency room, it hits on many of the outcome measures. We try to keep people off of steroids. We try to keep people out of the hospital so they're losing less work in school. We're, of course, trying to keep them out of the emergency room. They stay off of narcotics. They have a better improved quality of life. And then arguably, we have to work on these others as well. But as a first project, we thought we were making some really nice progress. 
when you hear about what people are doing, these are really great and very logical approaches that aren't that complicated, but anything we can do in our practices. A practice from, from Oregon in the northwest of the United States taught us that the way they decided to keep people out in the emergency room is to have a dedicated slot in their schedules at 7.30 a.m. every morning so that when somebody called their practice overnight, instead of saying, it sounds like you're sick, go to the emergency room, they said, come to our practice at 7.30 in the morning and there'll be somebody there to see you. And they had somebody there every morning. Sometimes nobody came. Many times a patient came, and that was a patient who was going to go to the emergency room, but instead came to their practice. I mentioned this urgent care hotline we developed at Dartmouth. Any of us can do these types of things. I'm not sure what it's like in your office, but our nurses get about 100 calls every day from inflammatory bowel disease patients. Most of those calls are, I ran out of my medication, I'm going on a trip, I have a question, but very few of them are emergency phone calls. But when they were emergency phone calls, it was stuck in between 100 other calls, and we didn't get to it for a day or two. And by the time we called them back, they were already in the hospital somewhere in the state of New Hampshire, where I live. So instead, we set, we set up a separate phone number that patients call. We guarantee them we'll get back to them within one hour. If they don't get back to them in one hour, we ask them to call us again before going to the emergency room. And then we do everything we can to manage it either over the phone or have them come into the office to see them. These are just the types of ideas that different practices tried out. Some worked, some failed, but we took the ones that worked and pushed them forward. These are some results that are really interesting. This is called a run chart. This shows you the uh, emergency room visits, hospital stays, number of CT scans, and the satisfaction that our patients had in their care over time. Where the arrow is, where the line changes from orange to blue, is where the intervention was. That's where they started their practice of the types of things I just mentioned to keep our patients out of the emergency room. And in fact, that you can see that patients' urgent care satisfaction went up, emergency room visits went down, hospital stays went down, and CT scans went down. So without any new medication, without checking drug levels, without combination therapy versus monotherapy, just by changing the way that we manage our patients, we're able to improve their care and improve the quality of care. We also, also developed these care pathways, as I mentioned. The care pathways that we've done so far are around anemia and are around nutrition. We could also develop these around optimization of biologics, about colon cancer prevention, but they're prescribed pathways of how we can all do things in a uniform way. Remember the first map I showed you of how variable things were all over the country? Well, this is a way to uni uh, unify everybody in doing it in a similar way, and we have these ideas of screening, evaluation, and intervention, and then follow-up. And everybody tries to stay on that path to make sure we're doing it the right way. We're more than happy to share these care pathways that we developed for anemia and for nutrition, working together with dietitians and working together with hematologists who really helped guide us. Just a few shots, and then I'll finish up, of uh, screenshots of what the technology looks like. We've developed technology that patients can use on their smartphone, on their tablet, or on their computer to tell us how they're doing. They get a survey before every office visit, so they report to us how their symptoms are, and at the same time, we're asking them to report to us what these outcome measures are. It's impossible to go through the medical record and chart. It will take too much time for the doctors to document all this. So in turn, we've asked the patients to report to us how they're doing, which I would argue is a, a fairer representation of their outcomes as opposed to us going through a chart and hoping that we find the right data that are in there. This is what we call our chorus dashboard, that we can follow our patients' symptoms over time to see how they're doing measured against the medications that they're on. You can't see it because it's a little too small, but in the top left corner of this is the answer to a question we ask every patient every time they come to the office, which is what's the most important thing you want to talk to your doctor about at this visit. And we guide them away from their symptoms. It doesn't have to be about diarrhea or abdominal pain. We suggest that if you're going off to college or vacation or about to get married or you worry about the cost of your medications, and we get amazing responses from them of things that are really on their mind. These are the questions they ask you just as you're finishing up the appointment and you're hoping to get on to the next patient, and they ask you that one more question about pregnancy or about they're worried about the steroids and being on and how it's going to make them look. But now we're getting that right at the beginning of the appointment, and it completely transforms the office visit. This is the part about co-production of care with their patients, really engaging them. And this simple question, if you want to do anything helpful in your practice based on what I'm telling you today, 
Have your patients tell you what the most important thing they want to talk about at the visit is at the beginning of the visit and address it, and you're going to make that office visit entirely more productive for them than it ever would have been if you were just addressing their abdominal pain, cramps, and bleeding. Finally, this program gives us management tools so that we can sort our patients by disease activity, by recent visits to the hospital or the emergency room, and narcotic use, and others. This is a screen that shows us that we can sort our patients by who's, who are the sickest patients, and let's see those patients back in the office immediately, as opposed to waiting for six months or one year for them to come back. Yet at the same time, we can take patients who have been in remission for a very long period of time and perhaps have them come to the office less often, and maybe thinking about cutting back on their medications as opposed to adding medications. So a really powerful tool that allows us to engage our patients, allows providers to plan interventions, and really allows the IBD community to disseminate best practices and learn from each other. So the messages I hope you get from this is that whether you know it or not, we have tremendous variation in how we're caring for our patients. I don't know what the right ways or the wrong ways are, but we need to get on the same page and be consistent and do things in a similar way and measure ourselves and make sure that we identify gaps, we test things on a small scale, those that work, we can spread more widely so that we could all benefit from it. And I hope you can learn from the work that we're doing, and I'm happy that we can spread some of these ideas. So again, thank you very much for having me, and I look forward to the rest of the meeting. Muy gracias, Dr. Siegel, por su excelente presentación y todos estos ejemplos y modelos a seguir nosotros en nuestros países.